our scripture this morning. Comes from Acts 2, 17 through 24. When the spirit moves. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents into heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are the Israelites. Listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan that foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. I'd like to invite Chris Joseph, seeking pastor this morning. All right. Thank you, Donna Buss. That is a Memorial Day weekend clap if I've ever heard one. <laughs> it's so good to be with you, uh, getting to preach. We're continuing our series on the power of God and the Holy Spirit and how God continues to be at work in our world around us today. And if you were a little bit like, wow, that's an interesting scripture, I hope you're ready to hear what I have to say about it today, because it is about the power that God is pouring out into our lives, the signs and wonders that God continues to do among us and in our lives, and I think it's a great text for today, believe it or not, you'll know why here in a few moments, for our confirmands. Um, but before we get into the actual word today, I want to take just a moment. We do something here at Crossway where we just take a moment of silent prayer. This is your, if you just need to take a deep breath in the presence of God, if you have something that you brought with you on your heart, you need to lift up before God, whatever you bring with you today, I invite you to do that now. So let's, let's take a moment of silence. Lord Jesus Christ, you've already been with us today. You've already helped us get ready from our various places, get to this place where we can come in and open up our hearts before you. God, we thank you that you are ever more ready to hear us to pray than we are even willing to pray. For the great stuff, God, that we're bursting to share with you and with the world, we thank you. We thank you to be a part of your new and creative work among us. And God, for those people who are just kind of humdrumming along, we pray that the inspiration you provide in today's worship would open up their, their eyes to see what you are doing. And Lord, for those persons who come in with great burdens, some of them, God, of physical health, some of them, God, of family turmoil and struggle. Others, God, seeking spiritual healing. We ask, God, that your grace, which you said was more than sufficient, would be powerfully at work inside of us and in this time, that when we leave today, we know that we've been and you're celebrating your eye-opening and your healing presence. God, we thank you for your work among us, and we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds and our souls in the ministry of your word. And I do pray, God, that you would hide me behind the cross and allow your living water to flow to this earthen vessel. Amen. So there are a lot of people that have a lot of opinions on what it is to be a Christian. And whenever I first became a Christian, the group of folks that helped me, and they really did help me, had a lot of opinions. And I'll leave it right there. But this was the era of the Left Behind series. Anybody ever read the Left Behind books? Oh, my goodness. None of y'all? Holy mackerel. One, 
All right, well, that's not, that's not going to be a good sermon illustration. Um, anyway, the whole, let me uh, back up a step. Um, the, the Left Behind series painted a picture of a lot of the prophecies that are within Scripture, and all of them were focused in upon that we were living in the last days. It was just before the year 2000. All that mania was going on anyway. I had just become a Christian, and so, man, my buddy said, you've got to read this book. It is a road map to the end of time, and you need to be on the right side. Well, let me tell you what. I plowed through book one. I plowed through book two. I drove straight out, bought book three. I was a marketer's dream when it came to that book series. And I was just flipping through, and I saw all these scripture references. And, man, I, you know, I was a brand-new Christian, so I was on fire. I was going to learn everything. I got out my Bible. I was reading it all. And year 2000 came, and nothing bad happened. I was like, well, they must have had the time wrong. And then I started going to a Methodist church where the clergy actually knew how to read Scripture, and I wasn't hearing all of this stuff being yelled at me, and I was like, well, hey, wait a minute. I thought I was on the right side of this. I thought I was all prepared for all this terrible stuff, and I was going to be on the right side of history. I was going to be on Jesus' side. So, uh... When's all this really supposed to happen? Imagine my surprise. Get back into the actual sermon I was, I was going to work on today. <laughs> Imagine my surprise when my pastor got up and read a text similar to this and said, thanks be to God that 2,000 years this was done among us. And I went, wait a minute. You mean all that's already happened? And Cal said, well, yeah, that's the whole Jesus thing. I was like, What? And I really, it took me several years, probably about $80,000, a seminary degree, getting ordained, and all of a sudden it finally all clicked. Ah, I get it now. What I hope for you and you guys, we're going to get to to the power of the Holy Spirit here in a few moments, but we'll realize that God has already ended the old way and God has already begun to do the new thing that God was intending. It turns out that this scripture passage that Donna wonderfully read for us is um, a text from the Old Testament, the first part. You know the scary part? The part where, you know, the, the skies will turn to darkness and the moon shall turn as blood. And, you know, that's like the stuff that horror novels are written of. But the Old Testament prophet Joel had written about a time when God was going to go through and very clearly do brand new stuff that no one had ever seen. Now, if you turn on the radio, someone might just read that text and tell you to get real scared real quick. But actually, what Joel was doing was was, was telling the people several hundred years before Jesus ever came that God is going to do a new thing. And when God comes to do that new thing, you're going to know. God's going to go through and do mighty signs and mighty miracles to start the new day. It was funny, one last little comment on that text. It says that at the end of the age, or it's actually uh, in Greek, it's, it's aeon. Everybody hear of an eon? You know, eons and eons. My grandparents used to say that. I don't hear it very often. An eon is literally a, an epoch of time, okay? It's not the end of time. I want to be clear. If you've ever heard all this, it's a big difference between when we say the end of time and the end of an eon. It's an epic. Let's think about a few of the epics in the church's life for just a moment. There was an epic where it seems humanity on mass was kind of trying to find uh, the answer to a yearning inside of them. People had developed all different kinds of faiths, religions. Some people worshipped stars and moons and suns and animals and ancestors, all kinds of things. Then God began to be a, 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 the, the one God began to reveal God's self. And people began to experience. You ever hear of a guy named Abraham? That God was, gonna, a, God was a God of relationship. And so the first thing we learned about God was God wants to know who you are. God wants to know, where'd he go? 
We're missing one. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> God wants to know who you are. And so we learned about God of relationship. And as that relationship began to develop, an epic where it was just about relationship ended. And we begin to realize there's a God who wants all of the world or all of society to have a sense of order to it. That no longer would things like theft or murder, or, um, envy and all such things, those were not the way that we would be able to experience the full relationship of God. Witnessed to in the first epic. And so we begun to operate under the law. You ever hear, you know, do this, don't do that. Okay? Well, that epic began to draw to a close. Did you ever miss a lot? We missed you. <laughs> so then we have a God of relationship and building upon the epic of relationship. We find God working through law and as that law kind of reached its human capacity because we started messing it up bad, God then starts a whole new day. A whole new day where God says, not only do I want relationship, not only do I want you to be able to operate in a loving, compassionate environment guided by law, I now want to live in you. I want you to know that you're not lost all by yourself, that you're out there on your own. I want to go through and to be at work in you. And that's the epic we find ourselves in now. We find ourselves in an epic where God is actively entering into the lives of young men and young women, of kids, of adults, of people of greater age. At all times and places, God is constantly knocking on our hearts. God is constantly <laughs> sending us divine text messages, seeing if we would respond, if we would open up our hearts and open up our lives for God to be active and at work from the inside out. The reason this is important for you all, do you know there was a day in the history of God's people where, how old are y'all, 12? Is everybody 12? Anybody 13 yet? Okay. So do you know there was a day where you really didn't even count? There was a day 2,000 years ago that until you guys got to this day, you didn't even count. How many of you knew that God loved you before this day? Okay. How many of you know that no matter what your age, that God has already been loving you? Do you know that? Do you know that little Polly Nell back here, which we'll say a word in here in a minute, um, little Polly Nell, God is already loving and nurturing her now. Not someday, not at the end of time, not when she finally hits some magical number like the law had said. Now. Now. God is seeking to pour out His Spirit into you now. And every moment of your lives is now with God. Every minute. The church was behind for a while. It took about 1,900 years before we finally realized that God meant what He was saying. That God's Spirit was poured out upon not just guys, not just old gray-haired men, which I'm becoming one of quicker than I like, upon women, upon people of all statuses throughout society, that God's Holy Spirit was going to crush any of our assumptions. Because you see, when God does everything we expect, well, then God's limited to our expectations. But God continues to just fly right through them. God continues to work in young men's hearts. God continues to work in young women's hearts. God continues to do things among people who don't even know that God exists. That's the new epic. That is the eon that we live in now. I want to address you guys here specifically, okay? If, it, if the shoe fits, wear it, okay? For you guys, 
This is a big day. I've told you, what, three times, four times now? This is a big day. You might not know it yet, but as you begin to grow and go forward from this place today, our Sanctu Cafetorium, you're going to see that God is increasingly at work in your lives. You see, in your baptism, you know that whole thing I just read about how God does these things? This is a part of it. These waters that you have been baptized in, God calls everyone into a ministry. I think one of your components in confirmation was a reminder. Do you remember the part about how I'm not just the only minister? By virtue of your baptism, you are a minister of Jesus Christ. I'm ordained, but I'm not the only pastor here. I'm not the only minister in this place. Now, that's a big responsibility on one hand, okay? You're now a minister of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you, it's one of the greatest joys of the human experience that you become the vessel through which other people get to know how to love God, how to love their neighbors, how to love themselves. Does this mean you're always going to get it right? No. I want you to remember something about who God is God is not looking out to punish you. Y'all look at me on this. This is important. I want your attention. God is not looking for you to mess up in your life. Okay? God is cheering for us. God wants you to grow and know Him. So even when you mess up, and i got to tell you, I'd love to tell you that from here on out, it's all perfect. Okay? That's a lie. <laughs> but I'll tell you the truth. Even when we mess up, we stay in relationship with God. Even when things don't go perfect, we stay in relationship with God. If you mess up on purpose, or you make a, just a dumb mistake, it's going to happen. We stay in relationship with God. I'm asking you four. How many of you have ever done something mom or dad told you not to do? Go ahead. You've got to tell the truth, right? They're there. <laughs> Did they stop loving you? Did they tell you, oh, that's it, you're out, I don't like you anymore? No. They probably, <laughs> Scott, don't ruin this, it's a tender moment. <laughs> that is a glimpse of how God loves you. You can't mess up bad enough for God to stop loving you. You can't be a certain way to where God stops loving you. God loves you all the time. What we have to work on, and this is the challenge that everybody in this room faces, is our capacity, in other words, our ability to receive that love. When we do things God's way, we're going to experience more of it, and we're going to experience God more. And when we choose to do it our way, it's not that God has stopped pouring it out. We've kind of closed up our hearts. Okay? So I want you to envision your discipleship almost like a little door that you have the handle to. Okay? Your ability to receive God's grace is a door, and you have to open it every day. You can't coast on yesterday. Every day you open up that door and you let God come in, you're going to love what you find. If you leave it shut, well, move on till tomorrow and open it then. Does this make sense? Are y'all getting this? This is the good stuff, all right? Discipleship is all about God always pouring grace on you. It's your ability to say thank you. That's what it's all about, okay? All right. Folks, same is true for all of us. No matter how far you've run, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how close you've stayed, no matter how much you've not strayed from what God has called you to be, doesn't matter. God's grace is dumped out on your life every day. It's up to us to say thank you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for these mountaintop moments. We thank you for this group of confirmands, how today is a day where they publicly say we love you, we receive your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. And we ask that this day launch them into a brilliant future. God, I pray for each person in this room today. 
And if we've been keeping the doors shut to what you want to do in our lives, that this might be a day where we fling it back open. For those of us, God, who are still in that skeptical land of not knowing if what we've heard about is true, especially in a world, God, where we've been conditioned to, to believe if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And yet, God, we know countless people in our own lives who bear witness of your saving grace. We ask, God, that we would have that same witness or a similar witness. Some way, God, that we could know of you not as some imaginary being, not as something far off on some giant hill or not as some big dude with lightning bolts on a throne. But we want to know you as our Father. It's in that spirit, God, that we join together in one voice to pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.